and welcome to Church Experience Online. We're so happy you joined us today. As you watch this teaching video, if you have any questions or need help getting connected, please don't hesitate to reach out by phone or email. Also, our website is the best place to go if you would like to access helpful growth step resources, join a serving team, connect in a life group, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially by giving online. At the end of this teaching video, you'll hear one of our Church Experience Worship original songs. And we hope that gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned. Thanks again for joining us at Church Experience Online. great, great summer when I was 19 years old. I had an opportunity to go out to Southern California, which was my dream. My mom grew up in California, so I was going out there every other year as a kid, and, and to me, it was this idyllic place and just a place where I could surf and enjoy the Southern California lifestyle, and, and I did. I went out there. I loved it. It was my first internship. I made $100 a week, and I was living on ramen noodles, but I'd never been so happy. I was so happy, and uh, Jennifer and I started dating that summer. We had a, a great summer. I was eating in and out Burger all the time. I was was riding around with my little uh, Buick with my surfboard on top, and anytime I got a break, I'd go hit the beach, get some waves. It was an amazing summer. Now, something I had to get used to, though, was Southern California traffic, because I grew up mostly in the Midwest, and so when I went to Southern California, I mean, six and eight lanes wide. I mean, it was, it was crazy. It was so different than what I grew up in, and I'm driving around with my little rusty Buick, you know, Century, and this thing is just barely making it, and I'm surrounded by vehicles on every side. My, my vehicle was not a great highway vehicle. In fact, we, we had a nickname for it. We called it the Green Grenade because it could blow up at any time. That was, <laughs> that was the name. It had the, the latch on the trunk was broken. So when I drive around town, it, it like was popped up like two inches. It just looked so, <laughs> it was bad. But I, I, had a, I had a great summer though. And, and getting used to driving was one thing because there's, there's not only vehicles all around you, but it's a bit dangerous when you're not used to it. Because as you're cruising down the road, and having vehicles on both sides and you see people merging continuously all around you, merging lanes, the, ch the challenge for me was that I had blind spots. You know, whenever I, I was driving, I, I couldn't really see everything around me. And, and I knew that the people in front of me on my right and on my left also had blind spots. So as they were merging lanes and I was merging lanes, I just knew that there's, there's always that chance that I'm in someone's blind spot and that they're going to veer over into my lane and they're going to hit me. And I don't know if you've realized this yet in life, but you actually have blind spots. And I have blind spots. And I titled today's message Blind Spots because as we're finishing this teaching series on public versus private, one of the most consequential aspects of who we are privately is to understand that we don't know fully who we are privately. We're fully known by God, and you know you probably better than almost anybody else other than God, but there's still aspects of who you are and how you think and what you do that any given point you can have a blind spot. And when you have private blind spots, they can impact your public relationships more than almost anything else. And, and Jesus talked to a group of people who had a very public blind spot in Luke chapter 18. And in Luke chapter 18, and, and Today where we're going, the message, I'm going to just try to give you a lot of the word today. Just, you know, God's word is so rich on the topic that we're speaking on. And I just, the more I was studying it, just the more verses kept coming and the more scripture kept coming. And so I'm going to just try to fill you up today with God's word and hopefully you'll leave full of his presence. But Luke chapter 18, verse 9, there's this interesting interaction that Jesus has, something we can learn from. It begins in verse 9. It says, to some who are confident of their own righteousness, they look down on everyone else. Jesus told them this parable. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people. <laughs> I thank you I'm not like the other people. You know, robbers, 
evildoers, adulterers, modern day rendition, terrorists, you know, like people that are really bad out there somewhere, just, I'm not like those other people. Or even like this tax collector, the audacity to, to say that in his prayer, pointing someone in the room out, thank you that I'm not like this guy. And nobody really liked the tax collectors. So everybody got what he was saying because <laughs> they would collect taxes for the Roman government and that's how the, the Roman government would uh, collect their income. But the tax collectors would be able to take a little bit off the top and sometimes they would uh, make that number pretty significant. And so people didn't like it. They knew that they were crooked, they were, they were cheats, they would, they would take money that didn't belong to them. And, and so this Pharisee, this really religious person, on the outside, on the inside, he's very much a judgmental person. He's pointing at this other guy. Thank you that I'm not like him. Verse 12, I, I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. So God, publicly, I'm doing all the right things. Verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, the tax collector, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This Pharisee had a, a blind spot. You know, he, he seemed to have everything together on the outside. But on the inside, his heart was not honoring to God. See, his public worship exceeded his private worship. Not the other way around. The more powerful your private worship is, the more powerful your public life is going to be. The, the more filled with faith you're going to be, the more that God's going to be able to use you in other people's lives, the, the better husband or wife you're going to be, the better parent you're going to be, the better friend you're going to be. The, the more powerful your private worship, the more powerful your public faith. But this guy had it backwards. He thought the more publicly I worship, the more publicly I'm seen by others as somebody who has it all together, then God will be pleased with me privately. And Jesus says, no, it's not like that. The father looks through the facade of what others see on the outside and he looks directly into our hearts. When he looks into your heart today, what does he see? What does he see? Well, one thing you need to know is that whatever's in there, and if you're like most of us, when you peel back the layers, if you can be honest, the parts that you can see, you're not always happy with it, are you? It's, you know, it's, it's like, man, God, I, I want to. I, I desire to, but I'm not fully happy. And what you need to know is that what God sees, I asked you, what does God see when he looks in there? You might have been thinking about all your faults and all your problems and all your sin. But when God looks inside you, he sees, he sees inherent value. He sees beauty. He sees a child of his, someone he cares deeply about regardless of your failures. He sees somebody he believes in and he loves and he cares about. And he's on your side but he wants to do a complete renovation, an interior makeover of your inside because he loves you so much that he wants your private worship to be genuine and powerful and God-pleasing. But this, this person that Jesus is talking about, and, and again, if we could go back to verse nine, remember he's sharing this story, this parable, to illustrate something. He's telling this story, as it said in verse nine, to, to illustrate the fact that, that some look down on others, that they consider themselves more righteous than others. And so he's telling a story. He's, he's helping us understand. He's saying, listen, this, this person publicly, they, they worshiped, but privately they didn't. And, and really what that is is a false humility. Because they, they, they're very prideful, but he was coming across falsely humble, meaning, you know, I, hey, this is not about me, God. This is about you. But inside, it was about this person. He wanted credit. He wanted validation from other people. He was lifting himself up. But notice what happened at the end of this story. Jesus says, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves, God will raise up. See, when we develop a prideful heart, the problem is that we don't see our blind spots. And I put it this way in your teaching notes. Maybe you want to write this down and think about it this week, is that pride blinds me. I've got to be aware of that. I can't see, I can't see my blind spots when I'm filled with pride. That's one of the dangers of pride is I just, I can't see my blind spots. When I'm blinded by pride, I might be self-centered and self-serving and not even realize it. And things are breaking down all around me and I don't realize that I'm self-seeking, self-serving. 
when I'm prideful, I don't see where I need to grow. I won't admit my mistakes and apologize. When I'm, when I'm prideful, I have blind spots that, that make me a, a taker instead of a giver. Pride causes me to put confidence in my own ability instead of in God's ability. And, and, and here's one of the, the, the emotional roller coasters of life is when you're prideful, that one of the blind spots is you, you get stuck in the comparison game. And one minute you're up because you pridefully think you're better than someone else, and then one minute you're really low because in, in pride that's masked you in this blind spot, you don't see that value, and so you, you put yourself down. Pride, pride causes us to be argumentative and combative with others, just to name a few. See, pride is really dangerous, and we're talking about the private battles of our life. This is why I said at the outset, like this is one of the most consequential battles privately because if, if you don't win the, the battle of pride, and, and if pride takes root in your life, then wow, pride can be so destructive. It's something that we all have to battle with. This, this Pharisee was thinking about himself. This, this seemingly public posture toward God was actually pointed towards him. And part of the issue with pride is that it causes us to look at our own, just our own situation. And I, I don't see your situation. I don't see your needs or you don't see your spouse's need or your friend's need because you're so focused on self. And if we could just change that, if God could do something inside of us to get us to start looking at other people differently, to start looking at other people before ourselves, think about how much your relationships would improve. Think about how much your life would improve. But here's why I think this doesn't happen. At least this is what happens in my world. For, for me, when I'm, when I'm not thinking about others, it's not that I don't care. It's that I'm too focused on myself. I'm just telling you how it is with me. I, I don't know about for you, but for me, when I'm not thinking about others, it's not that I don't care about people. Like, I, I love people, and I love being around people, but when I, when I noticed that I have been, in, in my blind spot, started to become more self-serving, and some of these things we just mentioned start popping up in my life, it's usually not because I don't care about other people, it's just that I'm caring about myself more. It's, it's, I, I'm, I'm in the center. I'm worried about my team. <laughs> I, I'm worried about my team, what's going on in my world. You know, there was... There was a really funny thing that happened about a week and a half ago. I'm a big basketball fan, and, and two of the best teams this year were, were battling it out, the Houston Rockets and the Los Angeles Clippers. And, and this was a, a great game, but there was something interesting that was happening that you might not know if you were just a casual fan, is that the coach of the Los Angeles Clippers, Doc Rivers, was playing against, or coaching against his son, Austin Rivers, who was playing on the Houston Rockets. And he actually traded his son previously back in the day. That's a whole other drama. But, but they're, 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 they're battling each other. And his son's on one team, dad's on the other team. And normally this would be fine until the end of the game when it was a really close game and it got pretty spicy. And, and Doc Rivers, the coach, walked out on the court to start arguing with one of the refs about what he thought was a bad call. And he's out there where he shouldn't be, off the sideline, out on the court, arguing with the ref. And he has a really interesting interaction with his son. Check it out. Doc Rivers is at midcourt right now. Tony Brothers. Look at Austin Austin Rivers. Rivers. Look at his son. No, that's the best. (laughs) Look at his son saying, call him for a tee. Tee up, my dad. He's on the other team, and there it is. (laughs) That, That might be SVP's best thing that he's seen all night. Doc's son begging for his dad to get a technical. And now waving for him. (laughs) (laughs) You know, they they were both so focused on their own team. You know, his family did not matter at this point. They were so focused on their team. But then what's interesting is after the game, like once the dust settles, the game is over, it's been won and lost, you think about how you're a part of a bigger team. Oh, wait, we're, we're still part of the same family. So Austin tweets this. I thought it was so, so funny. He says, well, Thanksgiving's going to be weird. <laughs> but I still got to sit at the same table with this guy. We're, we're actually on the same team. I just forgot about that. And, and, you know, for me, sometimes I forget what team I'm on. I, I think I'm on my team. I think I'm living this life for me. It's about me, what I'm going to get out of it. If I'm happy or if I'm not, if I'm winning or if I'm losing, I get so focused on my team and I forget that it's not my team. It's his team. And as a follower of Christ, I'm supposed to be living for him and his agenda and what he cares about. Not what's in it for me, but what's, what's for his glory, not mine. What builds his kingdom, not mine. But I can so easily forget this. How about you? You know, for me, it's, it, it's, it's a constant challenge. It's not something at least I have been able to win, and then I'm done. And then I just always, 
wake up every day and I, I, I live like Jesus, I think like Jesus, I serve like Jesus, I, everything I do is just flawlessly executed like Jesus. I wish it was that way, but it's not. Every day I have to fight the battle to say, you know what? It's not about my team, it's about your team. God, I wanna live for you and not for me. And when we privately get hyper-focused on our own team, when we privately get focused on our own life, our own career, our own goals, our own money, our own situation, our own wants, our own desires, we forget that we're part of a bigger family. And we need to practice getting our eyes off our own game, so to speak, and step into another player's shoes. How different would your relationship be if you could start walking in their shoes? I know you're feeling a ton of pressure with your work, but if you could just get in the shoes of your kids and the game that they're running, need you, that, that person around you. That, I mean, what if we could stop focusing on our own team and realize we're part of a bigger family? And I really think this is what a great classic Christian author C.S. Lewis was talking about when he defined what humility is, which is the opposite of pride. And, and he said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. So we have this idea that I just walk around my head hanging low, like I'm nobody, I don't deserve anything, I'm a horrible person. That's not humility. He says humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less often. So I'm not just focused on my own team. I'm not just focused about what's in it for me. I'm not just focused on whether I'm winning or losing. I'm saying, how can I help others win around me? How can I help God's team, his kingdom win? That's what I want to be about. So how do we, how do, we do that? Well, one of the ways that I think God, one of the tools God's given us is to live generously. Live generously with our time, our energy, our resources, always looking out with our antenna up, like who around me is in need? Who needs my help? Who needs my time? And, and just, I think the act of generosity, when, I, when, I, when I'm serving somebody, this is why I think serving is so powerful. We often say around here, if you're not serving, you're probably swerving spiritually because if you're not serving others, that means there's only one other option, you're serving yourself. And so, by serving and giving and living generously, it, it kills that, that greed inside of me of wanting more for me. It's all about me. Generosity is a gift. In fact, I have this theory that I think that the reason why God gave us giving, why he gave us this gift is actually a gift to the giver. It's not like when God tells us to give of our time, our energy, our money. It's not that like he's, he's up in heaven like, oh, I need this. You, I hope you will come through for me. Like, if he wants it, he can take it. It's all his. You know, it's, it's not like he's so up there, like, dependent on us in that sense. Like, he, he wants to give us a gift. Because when you're generous to others and when you give, it, it does something inside of you. It rearranges the order of your heart. And it's not like the Goodwill store. God's not like the Goodwill where you, you, you give the things that you don't really want anymore. <laughs> Some of us treat God that way. It might be with our time or our, our money. It might be with our energy. We give our first and our very best to all of our pursuits, our team, what's going on in our world. And then we have a little left over and we say, well, God, it's like the goodwill. I don't need this anymore. I got a little extra. Here you go. I kind of feel good that I gave, so this is going to help somebody. I feel I just drop it off right here. I feel good. And fine, and that's great. And God's happy that you're taking a step, but God is not the goodwill store. He wants your first and your best, not your last, not your leftovers. And he's deserving of it. But the amazing thing is, is that's a gift for you. When you give God your first of whatever it is in your life, you're, you're saying something. You're saying something to yourself and to the world around. You're saying, I'm not first. <laughs> I'm not first. He's first. And when I put God first in any area of my life, I'm making a statement to the devil. I'm saying, I'm not going to let you win the game in here privately. I'm not going to think, I'm not going to be fooled in a blind spot to think that I'm first because I'm not first. One day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and we'll all realize collectively, we're not first. <laughs> We've been living like we're first, he's first. You're God, I'm not. And so when I, when I give God my first, instead of my leftovers, I'm saying, God, you're on the throne. It's not about me. I have want, 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 want. That's never gonna end. But God, what I really want in my soul more than anything is I want you. And if I can live that way, that's gonna change the whole paradigm of how I think, how I interact with other people. And we're talking about giving, just, just real briefly, uh, we announced something last week that we've never done before. Uh, we announced that we opened a compassion fund. And between now and Giving Tuesday, which is the Tuesday after Black Friday, the Tuesday after Cyber Monday, it's a new thing. It's kind of gaining traction in our culture is Giving Tuesday. And between now and Giving Tuesday, we as a church 
we're asking people to sacrificially give above and beyond their regular giving a gift to the Compassion Fund. And 100% of that is going to go to help people in need. Um, we, we have been doing a lot of these things, and we'd love to do more of it. And that's just really what we can do is depending on what we as a church give. But we have been giving uh, scholarships for Christian counseling to people who can't afford it. And we love doing that. People can't afford it. We say, well, we don't want that to stop you. Uh, we want to help give you a scholarship for your first four sessions. We'd love to help. People who are in our own church body who are in financial crisis, maybe they've lost a job or a single mom that's going through a hard time and I'm going to lose my place. What can I do? Like, you can turn to their church. Like, we can help with those kinds of things. And we've done a lot of that. Um, there's an opportunity for us to do things like serve our cities, which we did in September. And we went down to real recovery and we served and we had an army of us unleashing compassion and we bought some things and renovated some things and, and the funds for all of that. It's going to come out of that because we'd like to do more of that. We'd like to get out more in the community, do more outreach, help more people. And so if between now and Tuesday, you give, Giving Tuesday, you give and you mark it online. There's a Compassion Fund or you, on your envelope you say Compassion Fund. I want to encourage you to give above and beyond to help somebody else to get your eyes off of self. I'm sure you have a long list of things that you'd love to spend a little extra on. We all do. But the needs will never be met if all of us are so focused on our own team that we forget God's team, God's picture. James chapter 4, verse 10. It says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You know what I think is interesting about this first part of it is it says that, that we're to do the work of humbling. You know, God, God can humble you, <laughs> and he might need to. But I, for one, would rather humble myself than have God humble me. <laughs> in fact, even when I pray, I, I, I shouldn't probably get so caught up on the word sometimes, but, but when I pray, for, I, I feel this in my heart, I'm getting a little too self-focused. I'll say, God, give me the wisdom to choose humility. <laughs> I don't ever pray, God, humble me, because I don't want that. I don't really want God to come down and, I'm going to humble you. I'm going to show you what it means to me. I don't want to have that to have to be the posture in my heart that I need humbling. So you can let God humble you. You can let God do his work and humble you if it becomes all about you. But I, for one, would rather do the work of it, as it says in James 4.10, humble yourselves. God can humble you, but you're supposed to humble yourself. You're supposed to live with the posture of humility. I want to humble myself. I want to humble myself. Humble yourself. Do the work of humbling yourself before the Lord. It's not about me, God. It's about you. It's about others. And when you do that, God will lift you up. It's something that we privately work at, humbling ourselves. And in your teaching notes, here's the amazing thing what happens. Humility opens my eyes to private blind spots. When I can cultivate a heart of humility, the cool thing that happens is that, that I can start to see some of those blind spots. Maybe not all of them, and I think that's why we need community with others. But, but I can start to see some of the blind spots if I'll humble myself, which is really hard to do. But if I can do that, then wow, then I can start to see some things. I can accept some critique and some criticism. I can accept God's discipline. I can accept the areas I need to grow in. But pride, it, it displeases God and it destroys me privately. But what humility does, look at what humility does. Proverbs 3.34, God mocks proud mockers, but he shows favor. Everybody say favor. Come on, isn't that what we want? We want God's favor in our life. It shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. Humility brings the favor of God. <clears throat> and I just, I just started looking through scripture. And there's so many examples of how God uses the humble in heart. About those who humble themselves, he lifts them up and uses them. Not for their glory, but for his. It's amazing. I mean, if you were to study scripture with the eye of humility, like who had a humble heart and how did they, what Proverbs 3.34 says, how did they find the favor of God? Let me just give you a few for examples. Genesis 18.27, Abraham great patriarch of our faith. He says, though I am nothing but dust and ashes. And his heart, it's, it's not about me. Jacob, in his lineage, who's God changed his name to Israel in Genesis 32.10, he says, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness that you have shown your servant. God, I don't deserve your kindness. Moses, who is one of the, even secular historians will tell you, he's one of the greatest leaders of all time, led million plus people on, on a, a, a multi-decade journey from one country to another country. I mean, sometimes it's a challenge for me to get all six people in my family from one state to another <laughs> with all the luggage. And, all. I, and he had a million, a great leader, and look at his heart. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? The opposite of Hey, I'm all that. <laughs> I'm all that. Now, who am I? Who am I? David in 1 Chronicles 29, 14, he says, who am I? And, and who are my people? 
that we should be able to give as generously as this. Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. God, you own it all. It's all, it's all about you. John the Baptist, who prepared the way for Jesus, what an honor. He says, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I and whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. I'm not worthy to carry the, the, the dirtiest thing on his feet. I, I'm not even worthy to carry those. That's, that's a heart of humility. I'm just preparing the way. Paul, Acts 20, 19, the greatest missionary of all time. He says, I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing. Now, only Paul can do that. Paul's a great missionary. God used, used him, inspired him to write the Bible. Only Paul can say, look how humble I am. You can't say that. <laughs> you, can't, you can't go to your friends, I'm really humble. <laughs> I just, what's your greatest strengths? Top, top three. Uh, humility, I'm just super humble. <laughs> it's like it doesn't, it doesn't work, right? But, but, but Paul, you can see his heart. He's, with great humility, he's serving the Lord. You know, it seems to me that humility, privately, is a public magnet for God's favor and his blessing. It seems like when somebody truly, not a false pretense like they're showing everybody how humble they are through, you know, publicly, but privately when it's just you and God, it's really not about you. How, how do you know? I mean, well, one, one way you can assess this is look at your prayers. Are your prayers all about you? God, make me happy, healthy, and wealthy, and all these things. Like, God, prosper me, bless me, God, you know, pour in, God, just me, 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 me. That's one way you can assess it. Not that you shouldn't pray for yourself. And not that your prayer life should just be a list of praying for everybody else. It's, not, it's a multifaceted thing. We're not talking about prayer today, but are, is it all about me when it's privately just me and God? Private worship, is it just about me? Or is a lot of my, my time just obsessed with God? You're so amazing. One of the things I've been trying to do lately, um, and I, it's just still a new thing for me, but in my prayer time, I felt like I was kind of slipping a little bit into a, a rut in some areas, and I was kind of doing a similar thing. And I, I said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give myself some intentional um, questions and prompts in, in some of my morning prayer time. And one of the cool things that I've added that's been a really neat thing is every day I try to think of uh, something uh, of, uh, in God's nature different, something different that I love about God, and I just try to thank him for that, or, or something just that I'm thankful of in general. And it's been really cool just opening up a new part of my praise portion of my prayer time. It's like, God, like someday I'll focus on your kindness, and some days I'll focus on your generosity and your forgiveness, your love. I mean, there's who God is. I mean, we can't even fathom. It's, it's all over the word who he is. He's in beauty. And so my point in all that is that humility privately is, is, is when it's just me and God, it's not about me. Isaiah chapter 66 Verse 2, second part of the verse, it says, these are the ones that I look on with favor. So God's saying, this is who I look at. When I, I look down from heaven, I see these people with favor. Those who are humble, everybody say humble. They're humble, they're not thinking all about themselves. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. They, they honor my word. They, they honor me. They, they honor my ways. Like that's who I see with favor. And I want God's favor. I, I want privately, I, I want God's favor in my life. And privately, humility is, is so life-giving. But, but pride, it, it, it ruins my life. We're, we're, on the one hand, a, a humble heart allows God to bless and pour in. A, a prideful, self-centered heart is going to ruin things. Publicly, it's going to ruin relationships. It's going to ruin careers. It's going to ruin so many things when, when, it's, when it's all about you. But then privately, it's also really in many ways a, a blocking of God's blessing because God can't in the way that he wants to pour out his full blessing on someone who has a prideful heart because what they will do is they will take all the blessing that God pours in and they will turn it around into just a blessing for themselves. But when he blessed Abraham, for example, that first man on that list, he, he said, I'm gonna make you a father of many nations, of many people, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna bless you so that you can be a blessing. So, so God's purpose in blessing you is not just so that you can sit around and consume his blessing. God, thank you for blessing me. Thank you for all that you're doing in my life. Thank you that I get to spend the richness of all your blessings on me, myself, and I. <laughs> like God's not gonna bless that person, not in the way that he wants to, not in the way that he can. And so, so pride ruins things, and it ruins things publicly too. I, I got a job in, in later in middle school, early high school, and I was really happy about this job. It was fun. I got to be outside in the summer with a good friend of mine. And we were, we were picking blueberries. 
up in Michigan, and it was such a cool gig. We got to just go up and down these rows and, and pick the blueberries and fill up these baskets, and at the end of the day, we'd take these baskets and dump them into this big conveyor belt, and they would measure how much we had collected, and that's how much we got paid, and so there's incentive to work fast, and we, we had a great time. We were real young and having a good time doing this day after day, and one day, uh, just me and, me and him just were out there talking, and somehow something came up. I don't know. Maybe it was a girl or something. We're, again, we're older middle school, younger high school age, and something came up, and we did we totally disagreed on it, and, and we started like getting into it with each other. We started wrestling around with each other, like, no, nah, man, nah. And, and we just, in the process of us wrestling around and kind of in this disagreement, like, we knock over this basket of blueberries that we'd spent a long time collecting, and so at the end of the thing, we settle it, you know, bro hug, all right, whatever, you know, it's like, we move on, but like, now we got a problem, we just made a mess, and so we were like, well, we can't lose all that, you know, income that we spent all that time doing, so we took all the blueberries, and we scoop them up into the, the basket, and uh, we, we take it, you know, at the end of the day, like normal, and we dump it on the belt, well, what we didn't realize is we scooped up a bunch of dirt, and so the guy that was our, our manager, he's like, hey, you know, uh, the blueberries are great. We want you to pick blueberries, but the, the dirt, the, the, that doesn't work. You guys are done. That was our last day on the job. I think my first time I ever got fired, like, oh, no, this is not good. And, 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 and why? Why did that happen? Why was there brokenness? Why did it break my little young career in blueberry picking? Why did, why did it hurt a friendship? Why, why, why? why? Because we were both focused on, on self. Like, like, no, this is my perspective. This is my perspective. I still find I have to struggle with this to this day. Like, I have to always put myself in the other person's shoes. How about you? Is, is that maybe an issue in your life right now? Is maybe, is there a private, self-centered focus that's keeping you from focusing on the other person? If, what if you could leave today? What if we could all leave today and just be a little bit more focused on the other person? That it wasn't just about us, that it wasn't just about me, it wasn't just about my perspective, my team, but it was about their situation. What's best for them? How can I serve? You know, when you privately have a heart of humility, God can just pour in his blessing. I love Proverbs 22, 4, where it says, humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. I wouldn't put myself in the prosperity gospel camp. Uh, we've talked about that before. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that that represents well what we define as a prosperity gospel. I don't think that represents well the, the totality and the wholeness of what the Bible talks about. Because if, if I'm just following God just to get blessed, and I, just to get more, and if God makes me wealthy when I follow him, and then no one will go wrong, well, how do you answer the person whose child gets cancer, and they love Jesus with all their heart, and they're living for him? It, just, it doesn't work out, because it's like, well, so I'm, I'm doing all the right things privately and publicly, and so then why, why this? And God doesn't say that, you know, that you, you follow me, and everything publicly is going to be blessed all the time. In fact, Jesus said the opposite. He promised that you would have problems. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. That you're going to have troubles and hardships. This, this world has been dominated by sin, run by sin. And so you're going to have problems. But with that context, when you understand that wholeness, here's what you also need to know. God is a giver. God is a blesser. And God does bless those who honor him. And those who have humble hearts, God loves to pour in. Just like you would with a child. I mean, don't you love to give? You know that it's not, you would ruin your kid if you gave them everything they want every time they ask. I mean, you'd be turned into a vending machine. Hey, hey dad, I want this. Hey, mom, I want this. You would ruin your kid every time you walk through the storm. You come, sometimes see this in public, don't you? The kid's breaking down. I want this. And they just scream loud enough. And all right, just take this and be quiet. It's like, you would ruin a kid if you spoil them and give them everything that they want. And God knows that. He's not going to do that to you either. But here's the amazing thing. He's a father that loves to give good gifts. And just like you love to give kiss, gifts to your kids, he loves to bless his kids. He loves to pour in abundance. He loves, he loves to smile on your life and give you increase and blessing. And it says here, those who in humility have the fear of the Lord, the wages of that, the result of that in general are riches and honor and life. I mean, you'll probably live longer if you follow God than if you're self-centered because you're going to live in self-destructive ways instead of healthy God-honoring ways. I mean, we could go on and on. Not the point of this message, but, but God blesses a humble heart. That's what we need to know. Because you can learn more when you have a humble heart. God can bless you when you have a humble heart because it's not about you. You can spot selfish, sinful, prideful, foolish decisions before they happen when you have a humble heart. You can help other people because it's not just about you. I was being mentored uh, just recently. I had an opportunity to go for some great pastors and mentors uh, a couple weeks ago and one of the guys that was there was referencing a quote by Bob Buford, and he said uh, something I just, I think I'm always going to remember this. He said, my fruit grows on other people's trees. How good is that? And humility allows you to think like that. It's not about me. Something else he said that blew me away. He says, you know, we're, we're the platform, not the show. Some of you think you're the show. 
But, but what if you could live as a platform and say, I just want to raise others. I want to give others opportunity. I, I want God to work through my, I want my fruit to grow on other people's trees. Some that I may never see. See, here it is in your teaching notes. Private humility precedes public change and growth. Now, I want to see change and blessing and growth in my life. Well, it's preceded by a private humility, a genuine private humility. And really, if we get to the core of this, if I, if I want God to, to change my heart, or maybe I'm seeking God and I haven't really bowed my knee to him yet, if, if I really want the transformation to come, if I want Jesus to do something in my life, I have to have a humble heart for God to really do what he wants to do. Look at this verse with me, uh, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. I just love this. God says, if, if my people who are called by my name, well, what? Come on, well, what? Humble. They'll humble themselves. If, if, if they'll do this, if they'll humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, so he says an if-then statement, if they'll do this, then here's what I will do. Then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. See, God's saying, if you do this, then here's what I'm going to do. It's an if-then. If you'll humble yourself, if you'll pray, if you'll seek God's face. But, but to do all those things, what did it say first? If, if I'll humble myself. Because can, really, can I really pray in the way that I need to pray? Can I really seek God and turn from my sin if I don't have humility? Humility is saying, it's this posture of understanding, man, my, my sins will ruin me. My sins are self-centered. They're about me. God, in humility, I confess my sin. See, humility is required for really for true, genuine confession. I have to humble myself before God and say, God, you're God, I'm not. It's your ways, and I can rationalize and, and, and give all kinds of examples of why I think my ways are better and, and all these things, but God, in the end, I humble myself before you. You're God, I'm not. And when, and when you'll do this, like, do you want a revival in your life? Do you want a re revival in your family, in your church, in your community? Do you want God to do more in your life next year than he did this year? Then, then there's the roadmap right there. God's given it to us. Humble yourself and pray and seek his face and turn from your sin, then I'll hear from heaven and forgive your sin and heal your land. I'll pour out blessing. I'll do more in your life through the person whose heart is humble than the person who's really focused on themselves. See, I can't really change unless I have a heart of humility. This is why this private battle here on the last week in this teaching series is probably one of the most significant. Because if I can win the, the battle of humility, then God can win so much more in my life. But, but in pride, I have blind spots. I think it's sometimes I'm just driving too fast down the highway of life. I just don't have time to stop and look and see everything that there is to see. And that's what blind spots do. Once a year, our family tries to get down. We try to drive down to the Keys. It's right here, and we love it. We, we love that, that beach island life. And so we'll try to drive down there, just, you know, just see it. And it's, it's always a cool experience. And we're coming back, going across one of the bridges that connects the Keys. And we, we came back earlier this year, and, and our fam we had a great time, and we were on our way home, and, and someone, I don't know, one of the kids, somebody spotted it out the window. They, they saw all these birds out in the water, like a ways out there, just sitting there in the water, and they said, hey, I think I saw flamingos. And, and we had seen flamingos at Zoo Tampa. We, we've seen flamingos before, but usually in a confined space, never out in the wild. We're like, that sounds cool. Let's stop. And so we pulled off onto the side, and we get out, and, and we couldn't drive back to where we had a good vantage point. So we got out and walked down this long dirt road, and all six of us are we're pretty quickly walking down there. We're so excited. We're going to see some flamingos. It's so cool. We get out there, and, and, and we get to the edge between some mangroves, and we can just see out where these birds are. And, and it's so cool. I mean, they're standing with their, their long legs, you know, and then, and then their bird body up on the very top third, and they're just sitting there, just chilling, hanging out way out there, and just enjoy. I'm like, man, that's so cool. It must be real shallow. They're just hanging out, like probably 20, 30 of them. And then something crazy happened. Like one of the birds somehow, in a, it detached from its body. <laughs> like, like the legs stayed in the water, and the bird just flew off. And we're like, what just happened? And in that moment, we all had this simultaneous realization, those are not flamingos, <laughs> wishful thinking. Like those are birds sitting on these pipes that are out in the water. They're just sitting there. <laughs> There's these birds sitting on pipes, and one of my kids go, they're pipe mingos. <laughs> so now we always have a family joke about pipe mingos. They're going to see some pipe mingos. You know, we were just going so fast. We, our vantage point, we couldn't see. We couldn't see reality. We didn't see reality as it was. 
Some of us came in here today and we're moving so fast, so furious, especially this time of year, that our blind spots are abundant. You're not seeing that person that you live with in the way that God sees them. I guarantee it. You're not seeing the people around you the way God sees them. There is room to grow. We have blind spots. We, we need to, in order to change, to see, God, see people like God sees them, we, we've got to slow down. Be still and know that I'm God. We have to slow down and spend time knowing God's heart so we can know others. But we also have to slow down and have time for others to speak into our life. You know, Jennifer was up here earlier with, with Sonny and Stephen, and they were talking about the value of a group that they had been a part of for the last three years, and, and this group, how it changed and developed them. And, and our leadership team this last week, we were discussing, and we don't have all the solutions yet, but we're, we're coming up with ideas on how we can do more to get people connected next year and get people into groups, and we just value that. And, and we're coming up with ideas on how we can connect because we know that the beauty of a group is not that you just need to sit around and, and learn more about the Bible and that's important or not that you need to go do the event or outreach thing or whatever you're doing, that's important. But the real power of a group is that you're doing life together with other people, that you're in community. You need to have some other believers in your life that you can share your journey with. It's not too often that we like pry into someone's life and say, hey, here's what you need to change. Hey, I'm gonna advise you, I watch you living, here's the problem. It's pretty bold to walk into someone's life and do that, especially a stranger, but even someone you're close to, right? I mean, it's not like you're out hanging out and you're like, hey, by the way, I've noticed you're really arrogant. <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't do that. It ruins a friendship. But, but here's the thing, when you're in community with another believer, you should share your struggle, share your heart, share your pain. And when you share what you're going through, the amazing thing is they can speak into your life. And, 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 and as you're sharing your struggle, they say, well, have you ever thought about this? You know, I wonder, you know, I wonder if someone else in your shoes would, would try this. You know, I wonder if, you know, have you, if, if you, you know I'm going to pray for you about that. I wonder if you've, and, and it's those kind of conversations where we're exploring together, learning together, growing together, that God really shapes us. And here's it is in your teaching notes. I need others to help me with my blind spots. I need others to help. And that's why the beauty of the church is so powerful. We need to be in community. We need to be together. And anytime there's opportunities for a church to gather, I hope you'll show up. In fact, today after the second service, uh, a bunch of us are gonna be out decorating for Christmas, just simple stuff, putting up a tree. And there's gonna be some building projects and things, plenty of stuff to go around. If you wanna come join us, we're gonna eat Christmas cookies and have a good time. But it's just showing up at stuff like that. Um, that, that. That allows you to build those relationships that we all need, helps us to see our blind spots. On the bottom of your teaching notes says, my confession. My confession. I want to leave here without giving you an opportunity to respond to this message because I think that all of us have an awareness, and I hope that you do, that, that privately we're prone to blind spots and we're prone to look at things from our own perspective instead of someone else's. And the Bible tells us if we want to change that, if we want to change, if we want God's blessing in our life, Second Chronicles tells us we have to humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face. So what, what we have to confess our sins. We have to turn from our sin. What is it in your life that you need to bring before God and say, God, I have been way too, you fill in the blank. God, I've been thinking more like this, less like this. God, it really has, it's been about my team. God, it needs to be about your team, privately, privately. What is your confession? Maybe you just want to write that in right now. Maybe this would be a good thing to take into your prayer time on Monday morning. Maybe tonight before you go to bed, get, get alone, get quiet. God, where, where can I? Where can I become more like you? I, I don't want to live about me. I want to live about you and other people. What's your confession? My hope is that you'll find some area in your life that you can turn over to God and that the fruit of this conversation today is that privately you'll start worshiping bigger. And that unlike this guy that we started with who publicly worshiped really big, but then privately his, his, his prayer life, his seeking God was very minimal. My hope is that God will flip that and that, that privately you have powerful worship. And the more powerful your private worship is, the more powerful your public faith will be, and the more powerful things that God could do through you publicly, because privately, you are honoring Jesus. Right on. Thanks for joining us at Church Experience Online. Please don't forget to check out the website if you'd like to get more connected, learn more, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially. You're now going to hear a Church Experience Worship original song, and we hope this gives you an opportunity to worship and reflect on what you learned today.
fight for me. Taking